I'm Alan Almassey, and I see, I see we still have people joining the call, but in the interest of time, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off. So uh, Design Perspectives is Miller Knoll's new monthly series on all things design. And for the month of October, we have a conversation with Knoll designer, Innie Archibong. Innie is an industrial designer, creative director, artist, and musician who recently brought his sensibility, design acuity, and collective influences to Knoll for the Equal Cafe collection. In this edi edition of Design Perspectives, he'll be exploring his unique design process, where he draws inspiration, and how he aims to influence the world through his work. So this will be a conversation with Mindy Renasco from Knoll and Innie Archibong. And uh, before I turn it over to them, just a couple of thoughts. We will have uh, time for audience Q&A at the end of the session. So please uh, type your questions into the chat field and uh, we encourage you to uh, ask your questions throughout the course of the conversation so, so that you don't forget them. But uh, again, please type your questions in chat and uh, we will answer those at the end of the conversation between uh, Minnie and uh, any, and we also ask you to uh, mute your microphones. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Mindy and Any. Welcome. And Mindy, you are on mute. Great way to start, right? Great. Um, loud, loud and clear. We can hear you now. Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Any, we have a global audience here today. Uh, so, so people all over the world looking to um, meet you, maybe some, learn more about you and hear what you have to say. I'm extremely excited today to have this opportunity to chat with you. Um, we used to see each other more often, but uh, with COVID and everything else, uh, we don't get that opportunity anymore. I know you're just coming off about with COVID, so I really appreciate that you're being so generous with your time today. And I think a, a good way to ground the conversation is a little bit of your backstory. For those that don't know, I mean, you've been so widely published. Um, I can't imagine anybody not knowing, um, but give us a little bit about, you know, starting here in the States um, and, and where that's taken you. Um, well, hello, everyone. And uh, hi, Mindy. Good to see you again. Um, so my backstory, um, I mean, without being long winded, uh, I'm, I'm from Pasadena, California, uh, where I attended high school uh, and also ended up at the Art Center College of Design to do my bachelor's in industrial design and environmental design. Um, I've worked in architecture. I've uh, had a stint, you know, making beats. Uh, I've lived in Singapore working in architecture and working in industrial design at 8 Inc. Um, and I did my master's here in Switzerland at the ECAL in Lausanne, uh, master's in luxury. And since then, um, I've been living here in Neuchâtel, small, sleepy town, um, about two hours from every big city in Switzerland. And yeah, I guess um, I've, I've worked with uh, different companies ranging from Hermes to Knoll, obviously, and uh, done some gallery work with Friedman Benda, uh, exhibited in a few museums. And I don't know, in, in general, I just try to lead a creative life. And I've been lucky to have a lot of avenues for that. So that's the condensed version of my backstory. <laughs> That kind of, you know, the way you delivered it, though, it was like, oh, I've done a little work for MS, I've done this, I've done that. Um, it's it's so extraordinary. I mean, your journey has just been so extraordinary. Uh, I think especially um, some of the Murano glass work you've recently done. Um, can you talk a little bit about, you seem to start with a project like that by really embedding yourself with the craftsmen and learning how they develop these beautiful blown glass and then you know, design around that? Do you start by the learning and then know where you can go with this? Um, tell us a little bit about that project. Yeah, I mean, well, with Murano in general, it's not necessarily, I uh, don't see them as, as different projects. It's almost like an ongoing dialogue with the, uh, with the craftsmen over there over the past, I guess, four or five years. Um, 
you know, I had my, my introduction to glass blowing actually here in Switzerland uh, through the ACAL with a glass blower here that I worked with and I continue to work with for a lot of my gallery work. But when I had the opportunity to get to Murano, I, I discovered, you know, a different way of working with glass that um, has been very um, inspiring and informative in, into the way that I work in general. Um, you know, one of the, the beautiful things about about glass is that uh, it's it's a material that that's it's basically alive until the moment that it becomes frozen into the shape that you receive it as you know as the customer, right, or whoever is is being presented with the art piece. So, in that sense, you know, this working with that material it took me out of the typical kind of industrial design and architecture process where you figure everything out, you lock it down into a drawing and then you proceed to manufacture um, because everything is alive and moving and you have to kind of be in the flow and on the fly. So, mm -hmm. you know, the, I guess the, the really important thing about the process of glass is, is that it has informed the way that I work ever since I started working with glass. Um, I think that you know, having studied the in in Nikal, one of the most important things about luxury for craft for craftsmanship is that um, you have to learn how to communicate with craftsmen. You have to learn how to walk into a space, get a quick understanding of the material and what gives its defining element, and then use that to create your vision of something that's going to be impactful to people. So, taking that perspective and and starting with glass as a, as a main material gave me a different perspective on how I design in general. Uh, so even coming back to the work done with Noel, um, I'm sure you probably remember from some of the meetings, um, you know, I could I could fly out to Greenville and meet with with you and the marketing team and the engineers and uh, and everybody that has their various inputs and we could take a look at the prototype and any of the inputs that come in, you know, there's this feeling of of getting information, synthesizing it and reacting kind of in the fly the same way that you have to react when you're working with molten glass, you know, because if if we're trying to make something in the hot shop and things start going left and somebody gives me some information and we have to decide what to do, you have to figure it out like that. So I think that started to inform how I approach kind of all I think, you know, the design process for me, you know, in, in my position here, I've had the privilege of working, I call it creative adjacent, because I'm not the creative really in the room. It's always um, wonderful designers like you and our amazing team of engineers. So that iterative process, I think sometimes it can get a little thorny. Um, and sometimes it can just, you know, it's like the sand in the oyster. It creates um, a higher level of design than I think any of us ever thought we could achieve. So I personally really love that process. And I think in, in our uh, working together, you really pushed our engineers for specific things, things you obsessed about in the design. And I think they pushed you also saying, we're trying to achieve a level of strength here that we need, where this will go in not only the contract market, but the residential market. And you, you know, of course, would push back and say, that's great, but it still has to be beautiful. All of that um, is just such a great, wonderful process to be able to be around and have input into. And um, I want to talk a little bit about that <clears throat> when I talk about the things you obsessed with. Um, anybody who's on the call who knows the Equo um, Cafe collection, there were very specific things. If you look at the beautiful ribbon-like arch that's on the back of the chair, it was something that Eni really obsessed about, making that as thin as possible uh, and ribbon-like. and uh, Eni, when you think of those types of things, things that I think designers see the world in a certain way, you see the world differently than I kind of walk by and maybe miss some things. So um, I love when you share some of the ways that you look at things, <clears throat> and I think it happens in all of your work. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Like what, what catches your eye, what's inspiring to you, and how you bring that to the projects you're working on? Yeah, I mean, um... I think uh, you're one of the few people that gets to like witness that obsessiveness, uh, you know, <laughs> as it's happening. Um, but but honestly, I think usually my goal is to 
even though I'm obsessive about all of these minute details, the end goal is to make it so that nobody even thinks about that stuff, right? Um, uh, a lot of times when, when I think about how I want to design something, or the impact that a design should have, I think about how we, if you're not paying attention, you mindlessly walk past a beautiful rose that's growing on the side of the road and you don't necessarily stop and analyze every single surface on it. But if you were to pick it and look at it, then you would be able to see everything that's beautiful about it, right? And so I think from an empathetic standpoint as a designer, the goal isn't to necessarily beat people over the head with how intentional and how much I pay attention to every detail, insofar as it's to obsess about those details to the point that they disappear unless somebody's actually paying attention to it. Mm. So when you mentioned like the, the surfacing of, of the, the arms of the chair and, and the, uh, the frame and everything else, the main thing that I was thinking was that, you know, nobody should have to pay attention to it until they have that aha moment where their body is touching it and they realize how smooth and beautiful and perfect the surface is, you know, how perfectly it, it is unobtrusive to like, you know, their, their muscles, which are flexible, like, you know, bumping up against it and then everything kind of forming in an organic and fluid way against each other, as opposed to having hard angles and things that, you know, are not, um, I guess you could say ergonomic from a surface standpoint. So the, the obsession between finding that, uh, the beauty visually, and the beauty kind of when you touch it with different parts of your body that's something that you know it's my job to obsess over mm -hmm. and it's also my job to push back on the engineers when we have like you know practical constraints that that drive us in a direction where we might lose some of that so you know for me it's about having the empathy for the end user and also for the engineer that's trying to do their job and for the marketing team that's trying to sell the object and then figuring out how to get all of those things into the objects, you know. Well, and those are the elements, I think, from the marketing side of the business to just articulating design to an audience that, as you're saying, it's not necessarily at the forefront of how they go through life. I think you and I have shared our love for Salone and, and Milan, and there's definitely a sense that the Melanese people really understand how design affects their everyday life. From the you know uh, AirPod case that you flip around in your hand, no one's thinking that somebody spent months and months and months designing that radius so it would feel that way in your hand. They just appreciate you know, like a beautiful stone you pick up on the beach. I feel the same way about the back of the chair, the geometry that you created, because what do you do with a cafe chair? You're grabbing the back and you're pulling it out. So how that feels in your hand, again, um, you might not stop and appreciate the design like you're saying, you just appreciate how it feels. And it's a part of the experience of engaging with your beautiful design. So um, I certainly appreciate that. And we try to take all those little tidbits uh, and bring them through the marketing into the sales team so they can then talk to a client about why this is such an extraordinary piece. Um, I'm sure interior designers on the call do the same thing when they're explaining to a client why they're setting up a space the way they are, why they're continuing a radius from this piece to that piece so subliminally it all works well together. So I, I really appreciate that about what you do and what, what you bring to the world. Um, do you have any, um, I know you're really into music and music is really what feeds your soul right now. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, with COVID and with business, you know, work and design starts out being this fun, really kind of um, creative uh, passion and then the business part gets into it. So talk a little bit about um, balancing life and business um, I know that's a little bit of a challenge that you're trying to solve even for yourself right now. And then how music is playing into your life and how that feeds your soul in a creative way also. Yeah, um, I think that, I mean, so it's, it's funny, the, the music and the design um, kind of like took, a, took up a main portion of my life at the same time, right? So, um, it, for me, as far as like creative expression, once I decided to to follow creative path, 
then my life became a creative life. So the music blends into the design and the design blends into the music. And a lot of times uh, the music is what kind of keeps me sane through the fact that I've made a business out of my design because the music doesn't have a business uh, aspect attached to it, at least yet, right? So I think that, you know, for from a creative perspective, um, I think that as a designer, as an independent designer, um, as a, a designer that, you know, runs a studio that, um, you know, as, basically as a designer that doesn't have a job, <laughs> right? Uh, there's, you know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pressure um, to, a lot of pressure to perform, um, a lot of pressure to talk about what I do, um, a lot of pressure to, to monetize, you know, my creativity in order to live. And, you know, I, I don't think that we, we talk about it very much because usually, you know, the, the people that, that could be talking about it um, are dealing with it and trying to figure out how to manage it. Um, okay. But it can be, can be personally something that um, can be quite a challenge. You know, I don't think that, um, I don't think that we have very much um, conversation about like, the need to to protect your mental health when managing your time and your efforts. Um, we come from you know an industry where our education and our work kind of culture um, is all about pulling those all nighters, doing whatever it takes to get it done. And and don't get me wrong, like that's uh, that has helped me to get to where I am, having that mentality, right? But mm. when it starts actually working. That's when you realize, you know, like, wait a second, <laughs> I have to, I've got to figure out how to balance this. And, um, you know, I've been fortunate to have have the music as as a balancing element in that, because uh, you know, you don't you don't anticipate it, but you do end up going through phases of uh, not necessarily creative block, but just being tired of being creative, <laughs> right? right? And whenever I'm feeling that the music it really quickly snaps me right back into it because you know the ideas come and, and they come right back and I think there's I think there's also like generationally or maybe it's not a generational thing because I'm sure it was probably similar in previous generations but but for me like you know I was I was born in the early 80s so like by the time I was getting into adolescence and music and hip-hop was all around me you know, it was it's a participatory thing. So I was I've been expressing myself creatively, you know, kind of for as long as I can remember from that standpoint. So when I start getting in, moving into the music, it it actually inspires me to design things, right? And and vice versa. So it, it's it has been a, an interesting journey. I'm still actually trying to figure a lot of it out. Um, and then there's there's also like the the understanding that that creativity is a fluid it's a fluid medium you know that i can kind of move move from one end to the other and, and everything in between it's just a matter of figuring out how to uh, make it into a business right so that so that i don't end up you know making music and and losing my design studio <laughs> that's how, i mean they probably don't talk a lot about that in design school um that you're really the CEO. You're not only going to be designing, you have to sell your brand, you have to market your brand, you're going to be asked to do a lot of things to make that happen besides just sitting and being passionate about design. So it easily can take over and you get less and less time to just be and be creative or feed your soul so you can be creative. Um, I, I think that's an important point to make that uh, for any young designers that are watching and, and watching you and wanting to be inspired that they have to understand it comes in a package. And I think every um, career path that anybody's on, we all, especially post COVID, are struggling with that work-life balance. You know, how do you feed yourself while still performing at a high level in whatever career you're in? So I think the struggle is real for all of us. Um, one of the other things that feeds you is your beautiful daughter. Um, tell us a little bit about how do you, I mean, I know she's high spirited, um, creative herself. So how do you expose her to the design world? When we were talking about 
um, really having an appreciation and understanding how it affects your life. You know, do you engage with her that way? Yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's funny. There's like, I don't know. It, it's, it's not like intentional per se, you know, it's not like uh, I've, I tried to impose design on her life. It's actually the opposite. Like when, when I show her the prototype of the chair and I'm like, look, this is a chair. It has your middle name and your grandma's name and your great grandma's name. You know, to her, she just looked at it and she's like, it's green and she likes it. Right? <laughs> her favorite color, right? It's, uh, it's not a big deal to her, right? And, and there's something, you know, beautiful about that. I mean, I, I didn't know that design was a potential career path until I was in my 20s. Mm. But for her, you know, she's, she comes over here and, you know, it's like a world full of color and, and design and creativity. And she sees every glass prototype that comes and she's been in, you know, the, the hot shops watching them blow glass. And really? <laughs> Amazing. She, there's there's a chandelier somewhere. I think somebody in Korea bought it, where she helped screw in some of the pieces. <laughs> there's it's just it's kind of just a part of her world, which is uh, you know a beautiful thing. Um, I don't know where that leads. I do know that uh, she definitely is is creative and she loves expressing herself. And I think it's my it's my duty to do as much as possible to to help foster that. Um, hopefully, if she ever decides to go into the creative fields, I'll have figured out this whole uh, work life. <laughs> yeah. Don't 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 work yourself to death balance, so that I can give her some advice. Give her some good advice. Well, you've got some time, and I know. I mean, in our previous chats, you had some great mentors in your life, uh, and still do. And I know you make an effort to really be a mentor for some of the youth. Um, that are out there looking at or maybe even not knowing that design is an option and you're helping to um, get the word out that this is a career path. Do you want to talk a little bit about who really has uh, been great mentors for you and then some of your work with, with the youth? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, the funny thing about, uh, at least for me, <laughs> the funny thing about mentors is I'm not, I'm not always positive that they have the intention to be mentors. <laughs> Right. But, but um, I've always, you know, I've always looked up to, I mean, basically anyone that I've worked for um, has somehow like influenced how I think about things. I've been pretty selective about, you know, who um, I work under. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my, my first real um, uh, mentor in this space, you know, would be an architect named Anthony George in South Pasadena. Um, you know, he gave me my first job working in his architecture studio, and um, yeah, I had I had no experience. There was no reason for him to hire me, except for the fact that I asked. <laughs> and and you know that I've learned I learned so many things from there that that carry on till now, right? Um, you know, I, I was fortunate to intern at Eight Inc. Uh, a few times, and then go work in Singapore with Tim Kobe, the founder. And uh, yeah, everyone, everyone that I worked under in that office somehow taught me something, uh, took me to another place with my, with my approach to how to express my creativity. So, you know, there's, there's, the, there's the, the creative mentoring that can happen, um, of which, you know, I feel like I, I only have a few of those, but then from the standpoint of how I've turned, you know, my creativity into, you know, the business that, that it is, a lot of that comes from observation, learning, and asking a lot of questions, uh, getting advice. You know, the, uh, I think that, you know, when I was on the, the trajectory for, for architecture and interior design, um, you know, I was inspired by certain architects. I learned from the bosses that I had and the internships that I had. Um, and, and then when, when I made the shift into trying furniture, I was fortunate to, to be found by Jerry Helling. Right. And, and that, you know, opened up a whole new world for me to get to New York, go to ICFF, see that there's a world where I can sculpt things in one-to-one -one scale. Right. And turn them into to products, and 
you know, that just, that, that took me into a completely different realm. Um, you know, and at each stage, there's been somebody like that, right? Uh, I get into working in, in luxury and, you know, I, I have like the instructors at the ECAL, like Nicolas Lemoyne, that when you meet somebody like that, you know, and they can kind of instinctually look at something and, and describe to you all the elements about it that make it an appropriate luxury object. You know, it's it's an intimidating thing at first, but then you slowly start to pick up on the nuances. And, and again, that carries with me, you know, getting into the gallery world. There's Mark Bender that was there that was able to, you know, show me the ropes of like and explain to me how it works, um, what's going to work well here, what's going to work well well there and you know then and again each one of these touch points you know have have given me more insight into different areas of the world of design um that that have helped guide me you know and that's that's not even to get into like every literally every single craftsman that i've developed a relationship with has been that's been a mentorship so you know, in the end, I feel, I feel a responsibility to try to pass on the knowledge, um, you know, the the work ethic, what it takes um, to to try to do what I'm trying to do. And um, I would say that uh, I'm still trying to figure out how to do that properly. <laughs> I'm sure if you were to talk to the people that I've given advice, you might get varying uh, critiques of how I've given it. <laughs> But. You think some of them are saying, yeah, I was going to be a designer, but now I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think it's great. I know you've done a lot of work with the students and, and try to inspire them um, and expose them to some of this, the work that you do. You've gotten into, you, you mentioned, you know, Friedman Benda, some of the exhibit work you've done, um, the amazing pavilion for the uh, African diaspora that you did for the London um, Design Biennale. Um, tell us a little bit about that kind of work and, um, you know, I guess holistically what that takes. And I know I just want to make sure we mention that it's now coming to the U.S. I think you said L.A. and one other location. Um, so anybody that didn't get to see that or just saw it online um, through some of the publications that it had it. Tell us tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, there's I, I think that um, I'm fortunate that that my path um, took me through different stages of learning. I think that, you know, the only way to really speak about the gallery work, the museum work, and the pavilion is to, to make clear that um, if I hadn't started with architecture and then learned about making furniture, um, been, you know, an artist in my mind at least, <laughs> since I was very young making, uh, you know, I did pottery for about 10 years and done all sorts of like crafty things, um, then I wouldn't necessarily be able to even have the opportunity to do some of these things, right? Um, so I think when when we talk about the, the gallery and the museums, for instance, um, I've, I've having this like kind of an artistic expressive approach to the the design that I was doing, um, mm. you know, always kind of made my work a little bit different um, when I was in, in school, in a way, not always in a good way. But um, I was fortunate that at Art Center in the environmental design program, one of the core tenets is, is that we're designing experience, whether you're designing a doorknob or you're designing the interior of a space or you're designing a city, you're designing an experience, right? Mm. So <clears throat> the idea of designing an experience from every minute part of the object to, you know, uh, a monument like like the pavilion um, allows me to combine that idea with whatever scale I'm working on. So when we talk about the work that I've done with Friedman Benda, um, you know, you've probably you've seen when you came to the show in New York and um, I've got an upcoming show in L.A. in November. It's it always starts with like a concept and then the idea is to make like an immersive experience where the objects are artifacts that tell stories of the over so pieces of the overarching story. So that having learned the skill sets to work for at these different scales and then create try to create these experiences that tap into something greater um, allows the ability to move between 
these different uh, these different like spaces or, or venues. So by the time we got to the pavilion of African diaspora, it was my first opportunity to get back to the monumental scale or the architectural scale, mm. and and it became um, you know once I was clear on the message that I wanted to to share, which is you know a message of of togetherness between the different far-reaching um, like members of the diaspora around the world. Um, the main message that the main underlying message that needed to come from me and my voice within it um, was was this message of, look, I am you know a child of the diaspora, and I am doing this thing that you know I didn't see very many people as examples doing before me. And I, it was important for me to employ all of these different, um, you know, ranges of skill sets in that. So, you know, it needed to it needed to carry the message, um, but it needed to do it in a way where it acknowledged architectural scale elements like the catenary arches, which you would find in bridges or in cathedrals that have, you know, weight bearing uh, properties. And then like the detail of the surfacing on each one of those arches you know, brings in like kind of the industrial design, um, attention to detail. And then also the the spirit of it brings out like the the urban planning, like monument uh, conversation as well. So I think bringing all of those things into it, you know, allows it to, if if anybody analyzes it to, to that degree, to, to be able to, in a singular kind of expression, tell the story of you know like basically a, a kid that that was creative artistic that didn't know that you could be a industrial designer or monument maker or any of these things until until his 20s um you know somehow is is here to to create a space for conversation and for for people of the diaspora to engage in this discovery right and um it's incredible. I mean, it was an incredible work. I think even the shape to me is sort of the the voice of the diaspora finally getting to a level that everybody's paying attention. This isn't just something that's talked about on a low level. It's like everybody's paying attention. And I just am so happy that it's finally moving around and getting to other places and people can engage with it and see your work. It's just truly, truly an amazing, amazing piece. Um, talk a little bit about, um, you know, how you were talking earlier about hip hop and, uh, you know, I know we had a short conversation, um, yesterday. Will that work, you know, your work where you're sort of collaborating and feeding off friends who are also doing music, you love the music, you have a design background. We talked a little bit about how hip hop as a lifestyle, you know, I also wasn't born in the 80s, but graduated from high school in the 80s. It's, it was just this whole um, movement that got your attention. So can we ever look forward to you getting all of those elements together and maybe creating an experience that ties in your kind of musical love and your design love? Is that going to be in the future anywhere? Yeah, I, I think, well, well, for one, there's I, I don't feel like there's a way to divorce any of my creative output from like hip hop being the foundation of it, right? So mm -hmm. I, I think that there's, I find it interesting when like, um, I might talk to some of my friends that, that are musicians and, and I'll, I'll show them pieces that, that I've done or that I'm working on and they, they instantly see, you know, the different parts of it. They can see how like the base of a table, you know, like has a certain type of energy or like, you know, has a rhythm to it that that reminds of certain things, or even possibly what song was playing when when I was inspired to make it. Right. Um, so for me, there's there's the, there is this understanding that that um, all these things like they they speak to each other, and within a creative person, they they come out. However, you decide to to bring them out, if you know the parameters and the the canons of proportions and all of the things and the rules that govern whatever, you know, um, whatever realm you're expressing within. So, you know, it's, it, it has become important to me to, to help 
show some of my friends and, and musicians and you know some of them like pretty well-known artists that that the, the way that they see the world and the things that they want to express can be manifest as objects that end up in people's homes right um the same way that their music ends up in people's homes and and i do think it's it's actually important and critical uh me for that to to exist in the world because i think that you know when when i got into making furniture it was very clear to me that you know the the expressions of what something should look like in your home didn't necessarily match the way that i would want to exist right okay. it's, there's and there's that voice that's missing in the design world where there's like a whole group of people that have something to express that we as consumers of design could be incorporating into our milieu of, of objects around us that just don't exist. And okay. the only way they can exist is if, um, is if, you know, we figure out how to get those voices to create the things that we can then put in our spaces. Um, I have a, a friend named Sean Brown, who's a great example of this. And he has a company called Curves, and you know they're they're making objects that are that are exactly that, right? Where um, you know you go and you, you shop their objects for your home, and and you can feel the spirit in the in the objects, right? And and it's so refreshing because we've never seen anybody expressing from that perspective before. And so for me, it's it's been you know a great um, exercise, just like. Not, not, I wouldn't call it educating, but just having the conversations about, you know, how I make things, what goes into it, um, you know, taking people to meet craftsmen, see factories, see the opportunities, see what we could collaborate and make together. And I'm hoping that, you know, be able to have some collaborations where we're bringing in voices that, um, that we would like to have some of their objects in our spaces because they're creative geniuses as proven by the music that they make. That's amazing. It's amazing. Thank you for that. I know we're we're at about almost 40 minutes. Alan, do you have some questions? I want to make sure if we're getting some of these great questions. People are popping in there. Yes, absolutely. We have some questions and uh, I would encourage anyone who has additional questions, put them in chat. Um, I have a question of my own selfishly and then I'll get to the group. So. Uh, uh, I found this uh, conversation fascinating, and any you mentioned um, earlier on in the discussion that you've done, uh, you mentioned a couple times that you've done work for Hermes, and uh, my partner works for Hermes, so I think it's really cool that uh, you know you're working with Noel, you're working with Hermes, you know, lots of people, right? But what strikes me about working for both of these two companies is, uh, you know, in a way. Noel and Hermes are both design icons, right? Uh, but Noel and Hermes are very um, established companies. I was Googling while I was on the call. Uh, Noel was founded in 1938. Hermes was established in 1837, right? So how, as a designer in the 21st century, do you connect with these iconic brands and, uh, you know, and, and help, uh, say, bring them into the 21st century, right, or, or make them relevant today. And I partially ask that question because I think of the architects and the interior designers on this call, many who are working for, you know, iconic corporations, and they're designing interior spaces for for these corporations, and they, those spaces need to resonate in, you know, 2022, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, I think uh, you, you might have pointed out something that I just kind of assume is obvious, but I one of the things that that I try to do or that I that drives me is working with these companies that have legacy. Um, I established pretty early on and maybe it's arrogant, but I established pretty early on that my goal was to make things that would last for generations. And the best way to do that is to work with companies that have lasted for generations before me. Um, so pretty early on, I, I, I kind of realized that if I was going to impact people on like a deeper kind of spiritual level, then time was never going to be a factor of when the object would be mm -hmm. relevant because it's going to be speaking to the souls of people no matter what time 
they get something. And that's why heirlooms are important. That's why, you know, if you get a tulip table from, you know, from the mid century, uh, it's still going to carry the same power that it carried back then. It's not going right. to go out of fashion, right? So for me, the best way to, to keep myself accountable to that is to work with companies where that's the only option, right? And um, like, that's something that Nolan Hermes share in common. And, and I seek out these opportunities to, to do that. And I think one of the things that has helped me to do that is that um, I, I have this approach where I, when I'm designing something, I analyze it and I think if I put this like if somebody were going to purchase this 100 years ago, would they purchase it? And if somebody were going to purchase it 100 years from now, would it fit as well? And right. it would fit in both places, but be done using technology that could only exist now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So again, like with the with the chair for Knowles, it was similar exercise with Watch for Hermes where I was like, OK, I'm going to use complex surfacing technology in the computer that wouldn't have been available 100 years ago. But if somebody a hundred years ago stumbled upon it, they would want to still own it. Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, taking that approach, it, it kind of hopefully at the time would be the only thing that would tell creates objects that have a lasting uh, ability to last that people would be touched by and they'd want to hand down. Um, and it, it kind of creates a, a through line with the different companies that I designed for, um, you know, about how I can connect to them that makes it so I'm not necessarily stretching myself to try to figure out how to design for a company that I don't really relate to. That's that's terrific. I can't wait to have dinner with my partner tonight to tell him about this conversation. So uh, wonderful. Well, let's get to some of the questions in the uh, chat field. Uh, so the first one we have is you mentioned that the equal collection for Noel was named with your daughters. Uh, mother's name and your grandmother's name. Can you tell us more about what inspired you to name the collection for three generations of women in your life? I mean, uh, All very dear to your heart. It's, I mean, the point is, it's, probably, it's, it's not that deep. It's like, <laughs> like I, love, I love my mom, I love my daughter. <laughs> They have this name in common, um, and you know, they, I think with no, the the go to is to is to name the collection after the designer, um, and you know, start to about after. Um, I, I mean, the person that came to mind was like, wouldn't it be much cooler if if this was a classic everybody says my mom's name every time every time they want to buy it right um and to me that was cooler than them calling it the archibald collection right right you know, well, a I, nice way <clears throat> go ahead mindy i just wanted to add i mean i've had the privilege of meeting Eni's mother and these are these are strong women he's talked about his daughter as well so equally spirited let's just say so um he's he's surrounded himself with a a lineage of very strong, strong women. Um, and the chair itself, I mean, as he was designing, um, I'm sorry, we don't have a picture up actually, but there are beautiful curves to this chair um, and, and the table is exquis exquisite as well. They both can stand alone or together. But to me, it's like in the end, having to be responsible for the marketing side of this as well, it really came together because not only does it have these beautiful curves, but the chair passes um, the large occupancy testing. So it's like one of the strongest cafe right. chairs out there. So when you think of the strength of women and then these beautiful soft curves, it was the perfect name. Yeah, I think I think that that's also, I mean, it's kind of a running kind of, it's, it's a running theme within my work kind of naturally that um, I'm drawn to make beautiful things. Um, and it's I, I don't know it's it's a natural thing that just following physics and what is beautiful is like you create these curves that are inherently strong so that you can they can you can get them thinner and thinner and thinner and they get stronger and stronger and stronger like through the just through the curvature that looks beautiful it's like this beautiful curve makes it so that the chair doesn't have to have really big thick legs in order to pass the test and it starts with the goal to make something beautiful and knowing that the geometry is, is also going to lend to that. 
and the 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 idea that femininity can be categorized as as, um, as having like a visual delicacy, but an inherent strength, you know, is is something that I think runs through a lot of my work. Terrific. So here's another question, uh, and I like this one. Uh, what's a project or type of project that you'd like to work on uh, that you haven't had a chance? Who should be reaching out to you? Uh, <laughs> uh, temple. Yeah, I think, uh, like, yeah, church. Apple, did you say? Uh, temple. temple. Temple or church. Temple, okay. I mean, an Apple store could be considered a, a church, but uh, I'm more so thinking like like uh, temple More spiritual and uh, spiritual i think um I'm, I'm really intrigued by the the baha'i places of worship around the world um they have amazing amazing architecture always um and i think that i think that my i think that i was destined to to um eventually make uh, at least one space that that um is uh, spiritually uplifting for people that venture to it. Oh, that's so exciting. I'd love to see that happen, Edie, really. Hey. Me too. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> Keep us posted on that one. Now we have another question here that uh, the, uh, the audience seems to like because it's got a few different uh, thumbs up on it in the chat. So uh, what is what is your thought about ownership of original work in art slash design relating to emerging technology such as AI that makes it possible for anyone to type in, and this is in quotes, a uh, chair in the style of, you know, pick a designer name um, and have image generated. Um, do you see this type of technology as a threat or an advantage to human creativity? And why? Uh, I mean, this is, this is, not a small question, um, but I, I actually, it doesn't worry me or bother me at all in any way, shape or form. I think that um, the most, I'm watching it and I'm hoping to, to find the moment that I start to see somebody utilize the technology to do something very original that has a soul within it. I think that like technologies on their own without like the human element can be soulless even if they look nice and even if they approximate the thing with soul that they are derived from they kind of have a soullessness in the approach to it you know it's kind of like um somebody might say that there's a difference between a hand carved thing and something made with the cnc but if you have a cnc operator that like has you know something flowing through them right then whatever they make with that cnc is going to be something special and uh, so because of that i'm not i'm not afraid of the technologies um i think i might be a bit too old <laughs> to to learn them <laughs> to employ them myself but um i i me personally i would encourage all like you know designers that are that are in the space where they're experimenting with these things to push it as far as they can, because you start off learning how to be somewhat unoriginal to learn the capacity of the tools, and then eventually you, you're going to find the way that the, that your soul can jump into that tool to make something beautiful. Well put. Perfect. So the next question we have has is what has been your favorite project to work on and why? <laughs> be very careful. <laughs> right. No, you don't have to say that. Maybe other than what you've done uh, for it all. <laughs> obviously, obviously, it would be the Null Collection named after my mother. <laughs> all right. Good answer. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I, did see, I did see one, Alan. Somebody is asking, can they hear your music anywhere? Um. I make a lot of luxurious things, and the music is probably the most luxurious and inaccessible. Uh, <laughs> Mindy's heard it. Um, I think that anybody, so the only time that my music has been played publicly was at my solo exhibition in, um, in New York last year. Um, my younger brother and I made a, a musical um, installation that features elements of our music that people could manipulate that was in the Dallas Museum of Art 
Um, there's probably a couple upcoming showcases that are going to feature the music. And um, yeah, that's, I think that might be the definition of rarity. So if you want to hear the music, you got to figure out where it's going to be and get there and then experience it while you're there and then remember well, that. <laughs> that's a good question. If people really want to follow you and come out and show up and support you, where's the best way for them to know where you're going to pop up next? Um, I usually announce things on my Instagram. <laughs> Instagram. Instagram. Follow you on Instagram is probably the best way. Yeah, I usually announce stuff on Instagram. I'm not like the best at social media. I should probably get better, but I'll usually announce it like at least a week before it's going to happen. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I don't know. Like the a lot of it for the music, the galleries is usually where the music comes in um, because that's usually where the pieces and the music have a direct tie together and I have more control over the overall experience. So the music will be playing there. Um, I did a collection with Say Collections in London where some of my music was playing and some of my friends' music was playing as well. And I might be possibly producing something for the past couple of years with one of my childhood friends um, that who knows what could happen with that. Little teaser there. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, don't, don't like wait for it though. <laughs> it won't be out for holiday uh, shopping. <laughs> Study. Yeah. So I, I like this question here. It's what is the smallest piece of design that you have enjoyed? Uh, the watch for Hermes. Uh -huh. It's beautiful. I, I keep telling Edie it would be so much easier for me if I could go this beautiful watch from Hermes. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. I'm still waiting for mine. I just need to go over there and ask. <laughs> well, I can't believe you don't have one. You should. Uh, Oh, it's it's my own it's my own fault. I'm like I'm such a perfectionist that uh, I have like I have a few custom models that I'm I'm designing one of ones that that I'm not going to be satisfied till I'm satisfied. <laughs> right, mom, mom's on the list. And this, Edie, just about the watch. I remember you saying it's sort of an androgynous sizing, right? That you purposely created it so it would be comfortable on both men and women. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a feminine watch as opposed to a woman's watch. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the there's two sizes now, actually. So the the, the original size um, is is in between like a man's vintage watch and a large lady's watch. Um, and then the small size is, is more um, what probably, you know, women with, with daintier watches are, are accustomed to. But the shape of it and the sizing of it and everything about it was meant so that a man or a woman could take it on. Um, for for the men that have um, you know maybe larger wrists, I would recommend getting a custom double tour strap. You can ask at any Hermes store for them to make you a custom strap that goes around twice. Yeah, that's and, cool. And, and yeah. I imagine you could do it in a variety of different colors too, right? The strap. We the beautiful thing about Hermes is you can kind of do what you want if you have the money. <laughs> sure, sure. So here, a couple more questions. We have a couple more minutes. And uh, so uh, how do you, this is another deep question. How do you maintain, protect, keep, and cultivate your authenticity of the design process? Um, I don't even, I mean, I've been like, I haven't really, about um, being authentic since I was in school, to be honest. It's just kind of like, I just do whatever jumps into my head. I, and I don't know, I don't, first, I don't, I'm, this isn't like any kind of recommendation. I think everybody should do whatever works for them. Uh -huh. uh, I'm not like a huge consumer of design. I see design when I go to the fairs and shows. Um, I'd like to see the stuff that my friends are designing, um, but I'm not like, I don't have any magazine subscriptions. I'm not like pouring through design stuff mm. to get inspiration. I feel like there's so much inspiration from all the stuff that I study. <laughs> sure. 
So from that standpoint, um, I, I don't know, like something jumps into my head and I just kind of do it. Um, Sorry if that's not a great no, answer. No, that you know, uh, it, it's an authentic answer, right? So, um, so um, you know, one final question um, uh, because we're almost at the top of the hour. This one may be a difficult question to answer, and I suspect it goes to both uh, any and Mindy. But um, is there more collaboration coming with Noel? Well, we have a new design director. Jonathan Olivares, um, who is just sort of getting his feet wet and looking at collaboration. So we're hopeful that we'll continue to work with Eni and he'll bring some more of his great work here. Um, I just want to touch on your last question. If part of that was in, I, I think Eni shows up to anything he does as his authentic self and brings a lot of parts of his life experience to that. And with Noel, as with I think anybody he partners with, he partners with companies that allow his authenticity to come through the design. So we're in no way trying to sort of um, tamp down any of the things he's bringing. We're working with him for a reason because we want all of that. Um, and he certainly brings it. You'll, you'll see a lot of it. If you look at the products he's done, you'll see that energy, that spirituality, all the stuff he talked about on the call today, the emotion come through his work. Yeah. Well, well said. And and I also was thinking about it a bit more to be authentic and to be completely honest. There's just like, I think back to the hip hop thing, like coming from, from, from hip hop, there's just an approach and a mentality that, that is attached to, um, you know, authenticity and like, like being your own creative that simultaneously and paradoxically, um, also acknowledges that everything that you're going to do to express yourself is made up from pieces that you've stolen from somewhere else, right? So like the same way that, you know, I make, uh, I might produce a song sampling the horn from here, the drum from here, this from there, this from there, and then combining it to my own uh, composition. It's, it's just kind of the way that I see everything. So in a sense, I think one of the ways that I might remain authentic is by recognizing that I'm just going to be borrowing pieces of my experience from all over the place to express something the only way that in the way that only I can, right? So that I think is um, probably the key to my authenticity is not pretending like anything is completely original. Beautiful, <laughs> wonderful. Well. Uh Thank you. Thank you so much, Inny. Thank you so much, Mindy, for joining uh, this month's Design Perspectives. It's been a real treat uh, for the uh, uh, audience or guest out there. Thank you for giving us uh, your time. Uh, look for an invitation for the November Design Perspectives. We'll be sharing Miller Knowles' point of view on the future of work. So uh, again, thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day. See you soon. Thanks, Bye. everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye, Amy.